Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for the introduction and your presentation. Um, I have to uh, decided to give a very broad overview, actually, of this very complex issue of women's rights and gender mainstreaming. Because it is not until the mid-90s of the 20th century that the question of women's rights is an integral part of the universal human rights discussion. The experiences of women have slowly influenced the process of general safeguarding of human rights. The integration of women and gender in the, in the activities of the UN followed the listed milestones. In 1945, the gender discrimination prohibition was postulated in the UN Charter. This happened for the first time on an international level. In 1946, the UN Women's Com Commission was created. This was followed by a declaration on the elimination of discrimination against women. In 1975, it was the first conference on women, which was held in Mexico City. Three years later, the Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women was founded, and only until 1993, women's rights were recognized as human rights. You have to imagine and for how long we had to wait until women's rights had to, were recognized as human rights. It's a long time, I must say. So what happened in the, until the mid, uh, in the mid uh, 20th century until today? Um, just across the border from where I live, I'm from Salzburg, and just across the border it's Bavaria. And there in Bavaria, by 1958, a husband could actually terminate the employment of his wife without any notice. Hmm? But I don't say that Austria was any better, don't get me wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I can't say that. I can give you examples. In Bavaria, teachers had to leave their jobs once they got married. Because as a teacher, you actually were expected to be not married, to not live in a relationship. It was, it was the mood, it was the attitude at that time. It took quite a while until the law on the equality of men and women, which was adopted in 1957, entered into force in July 1958, and the right of a final decision in all marriage issues was revoked, meaning that men no longer had power over their wives. I am born in 1963. I come from a traditional family. Let me share this personal or family uh, moment with you. And I still remember the time when my mother had to say, oh, we have to ask dad. I was a very small child at that time, but still that was in the late 60s. Even though my family was quite progressive, I have to say. But that was the attitude, that was the way of living that we had. From the 1980s onwards, the weakness of the implementation of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights has repeatedly been criticized by feminists worldwide. And the fact that human rights violations against women would not be taken seriously for various reasons also cause for uh, cause great uh, cause for concern. So what do we have here if we criticize uh, the implementation of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights? Critics point out that Article 12 has been implemented by many countries and governments which have been using it as an explanation for treating human rights violations against women as a private matter. In my country, it is still the cause for a lot of families when there is a family issue of violence against women or children, oh, this is not your matter, don't talk about it. Just don't mention it. Don't mention it at school, don't mention it anywhere. And more and more in the past 20 years, I must say that in Austria, women dare to step out. Women dare to say, oh, I have a problem. You hear it. Not that all Austrian men are, are very brutal, but it happens. It happens everywhere. We must know this. We must be aware of this, I think. So the right of men to privacy, family, and personal honor in the jurisprudence had higher priority, actually, than the rights of women, for example, regarding their physical integrity. Human rights violations against women were taking place largely in private and not in public space. And this is another very big problem because once it took place in a public space, they even now, already now, they get the attention. 
Even though I can also give you the Austrian example, many people tend to say, oh, it's not my business, and they look in the other way, in the other direction. So it, it, society still needs to change, actually, before we can say that women rights are human rights. Furthermore, numerous critics have criticized the declaration of human rights on the grounds of protection of the individual against encroachment by the state. The UN Declaration of Human Rights of 1948 did not intend to protect victims against abuse by private individuals, since these violations were committed by individuals and they were not prosecuted. They are now. There is, lo there is a law now. There, is, there are commissions now um, for several issues. They are in all countries, but it always depends on the, on the cooperation. If I think of a Danish issue, I'm a member of the petitions committee, and there they have good, good committees. But it is the question of whether they really act according to their guidelines or not. And this is, um, of course, this goes back then to the person who are in the committees, who are the people to speak to the, to the victims. Another point of criticism is the fact that the situation of women was not mentioned in the Declaration of Human Rights and was therefore more or less ignored by human rights organizations worldwide. Therefore, women are exposed to the same human rights violation as men. For example, if you think of the persecution based on religion or race, you also have that everywhere. But on top of that, they are also subject to women-specific human rights violations, such as sexual torture or forced prostitution, or for example, also female genital uh, mutilation, if you think of that. I was in, in London for, the, uh, for a conference on that issue. And even that happens, uh, I'll have to say, in a lot of European countries also. And this worsens their situation. So it was still common use to tolerate systematic and structurally related human rights violation against women in the 1990s and onwards in countries such as Afghanistan or Iran, for example, in the name of cultural diversity. We also must understand the difference in the cultures. Um, yes, there were parts in Europe, there are still probably parts in Europe where men see their wife as um, something that belongs to them. But there are uh, cultures and there are countries where we have cultures where this is actually still a tradition. We must be aware of this. And we, we, I think to change a problem, we must understand the culture and we must explain to, to the people that if they want to, to protect the women, then they must change within the culture. The change must come from, within, from the bottom, so to say. So do we speak about human rights or women's rights? The closely interwoven problems, as stated already, led, according to critics, to structurally related human rights violations against women. These violations were often not perceived as a violation of human rights, but international organizations and NGOs considered them special cases. They were treated as women's rights instead of human rights. There is the question for you, why would we like split the women's rights from the humans' rights? Are women not human? Might be a good discussion question for you later, I think. In the 1970s, uh, there was a slogan created where we talk about women's rights are human rights. And women's rights organizations pointed out that there are also gender-specific human rights violations of which women are affected in many places. Also nowadays, or still nowadays, think of when a woman comes to work in a, in a dress instead of a suit. Uh, she, might, she might be harassed in certain ways. Uh, that is very, com very common. And women, when it comes to, to violation of women's rights at the workplace, I must say uh, I have heard of many cases where women do not dare to speak out. So also this might be a point of consideration. It is important that human rights are also available for the prosecution of gender-specific violations. It was pointed out 
in decade-long work of educational and lobbying that, for example, forced prostitution should be treated as slavery, domestic violence, and systematic rape as torture. Just think of war, of war countries uh, where we have this problem everywhere. We had it in Europe in the 90s, if, if you think of the former Yugoslavia. So there is a lot to change. In 1976, the United Nations Development Fund for Women was founded amongst others and has ever since then contributed to strengthen the social and economic situation of women worldwide. The main focus of the actions of modern women's rights organizations are forced prostitution, forced marriage, honor killings, targeted abortions of female fetuses, infanticide of female infants, female genital mutilation, and the limited access to education for girls. If you think of the South, uh, South Asian countries, if of Nepal, for example, uh, governmental organizations tend to neglect or deny this problem that girls in their country, in this region, don't have the same access as boys do. But I was very shocked once and, uh, a representative of an NGO came to my office and said, Mrs. Wertmann, you must understand one thing. Once the, girl, uh, uh, the girl's body starts to change, the girl for some days cannot go to school because there is no proper toilet. I didn't, I didn't know it. I didn't believe it. But so we, I think the, the whole prospect, the whole discussion has to, has to change in the way that we have to, to give girls exactly the same conditions to go to school, to, to participate in daily life, in active life, in public life, as to boys. I think it starts there. It starts already one step, so to say, prior is the family. We must change. We must talk to the families. We really should go and talk to the, to the husbands, to the fathers, to make them aware that a girl with an education is an enrichment for him. He should be proud of, of this girl, of this daughter. And there is a lot to do, I must say. So, uh, yeah, the declaration of um, the Vienna Declaration and the declaration on the, in, on the elimination of violence against women came in 1993. That is also a very important step because it is the first international declaration ever. And the final, which was like the final issue of this meeting was condemned because human rights of women and girls are inalienable, integral, and indivisible part of human in, uh, universal rights. So in, it takes all this time until 1993, until the public, so to say, said, yes, they are part of human rights. You can't discuss about women's rights because they are so normal. Imagine this long period of time that, ha that we all had to go through, actually, no? Let me say one word on the UN Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women before um, we, go, um, we talk a little bit about gender mainstreaming. The Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women is abbreviated as CEDAR, and under this, I believe many of you know it. Um, it is defined as, I quote, every limitation based on gender differences with the result or goal to eliminate the equality of men and women, acknowledgement or exercise of human rights and basic rights by women, regardless of marital status in the political, economic, social, cultural, civil, or other areas. And it helps actually women. I can give you a few examples of the petitions committee where I know of women who have turned to the CEDAR committee. And um, there are so to say interim measures which are not very highly um, accepted and respected by the states, by the member states. But the final decisions, I was told and I was ensured, would be, uh, would be respected and would be actually carried through. So I think uh, concerning all the different problems that women have and that women uh, of Europe or within the European uh, Union, even within the European Union, 
turn to the CEDAW committee, actually get the attention and the member states of the European Union actually then carries out the decision of the CEDA committee. So it is very important to understand all these issues that we have here, that a lot has been done, a lot still must be done. Concerning the mainstreaming, uh, a gender perspective in all types of activities is a globally accepted strategy for promoting gender equality. Mainstreaming is not an end in itself, but a means to goal of gender equality. It involves ensuring that gender perspectives and attention to the goal of gender equality are all central to all activities. So this is very, very important to be aware of this. The equality be me, between men and women, what does this actually mean? It refers to the equal rights responsibilities and opportunities of women and men and girls and boys. I can also give you um, a very current example. I was at a friend's house two weeks ago and she said, oh, can you help me turn the bulb um, back into the, into the faucet, I believe you say? And I said, why don't you do it yourself? And he said, well, she goes and does the groceries and I do the, the, the workforce, uh, the work uh, when, when it comes to like hammer a nail into the wall, do the bulb, etc." And I was like, wow, you're quite a traditional family. So you allow her to go to work. Yes, that's her right. I said, well, the same situation, it is her right, it is her obligation to hammer the nail into the wall as it is actually your right and your obligation to go and do the groceries. And as long as we have these discussions wherever you go, I don't think we have equal rights and we don't have equal obligations because I think we women must be aware of the fact that we cannot expect to have equal rights if we ask our husband, our partner, to help to hammer the nail or to do actually this work for us. Uh, that, that's another point I think that, should, that we all must be very much aware of. So equality does actually not mean that women and men will become the same, but that women's and men's rights responsibilities and opportunities will not depend on whether they are born male or female. We have the same rights. We have the same obligations. We have the same rights as our husbands have, our partners have. As a mother, you have the same right as the father, but vice versa. Many women tend to forget that also the father has the right to participate in the education. And in my per very personal view, he has the obligation to participate in the right of the, uh, in the education of the child, not only the right. So there is a, a still a long way to go, I believe. Gender equality is not a woman's issue, but should concern and fully engage men as well as women. I have met in the course of the last two years, two and a half years, I have met so many men who said, oh, this is women's business. I said, no, you must understand that you actually should participate to understand what it actually means to have equal rights. That you know what women actually want, what you, that you know that what actually women need in their way, in their, in, their, in their development, to become equal. So equality between men and we, uh, women is seen both as a human rights issue and as a precondition for and an indicator of sustainable people-centered development. And I would like to stop here. I must say the topic is one of my, one of my topics that really sticks to my heart. I could talk for days about this topic, but I see already my colleague here and I believe it's time to close. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>